Biden was in Israel on a Wednesday meeting with the prime minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, and he made some remarks after that meeting. Let's play those remarks and get your analysis of what he's saying. I come to Israel with a single message. You're not alone. We're going to make sure we have what you have, what you need to protect your people, to defend your nation. For decades, we've ensured Israel's qualitative military edge. And later this week, I'm going to ask the United States Congress for unprecedented support package for Israel's defense. I understand and many Americans understand. You can't look at what has happened here to your mothers, your fathers, your grandparents, sons, daughters, children, even babies, and not scream out for justice. Justice must be done. But I caution this while you feel that rage. Don't be consumed by it. After 9-11, we were enraged in the United States. While we sought justice and got justice, we also made mistakes. The vast majority of Palestinians are not Hamas. Hamas does not represent the Palestinian people. Palestinian people are suffering greatly as well. We mourn the loss of innocent Palestinian lives like the entire world. I was outraged and saddened by the enormous loss of life yesterday in the hospital in Gaza. Based on the information we've seen to date, it appears the result of an errant rocket fired by a terrorist group in Gaza. Today, I asked the Israeli cabinet, who I met with for some time this morning, to agree to the delivery of life-saving humanitarian assistance to civilians in Gaza. Today, I'm also announcing $100 million in new U.S. funding for humanitarian assistance in both Gaza and the West Bank. This money will support more than 1 million displaced and conflict-affected Palestinians, including emergency needs in Gaza. We must keep pursuing peace. We must keep pursuing a path so that Israel and the Palestinian people can both live safely in security, in dignity, and in peace. For me, that means a two-state solution. We so there's a lot packed into that montage of highlights. But what I hear Biden saying is that America will keep funding Israel's military defense, that he's working to provide aid to Palestinians, telling Israel not to let rage cloud their wartime judgment, and that he still believes in a two-state solution. What are your reactions to Biden's comments? And what are your critiques of his overall diplomatic approach? I think that Biden says a lot of very valid things in this interview. I think it is quite helpful that he has raised the example of our own conduct after 9-11 and acknowledge mistakes and missteps that were taken and excesses that were taken. Uh, I think it's also valid for him, of course, to validate that they're suffering on both sides. Here's where I have a problem. On a rhetorical level, Many of the things that Biden is saying, in my view, are correct and are the right things to say. On a practical level, are we actually doing those things? He says that he believes in the two-state solution. The United States has long abandoned actually putting any pressure to make sure that there's an achievement towards that. It was quite interesting in the New York Times article that Tom Friedman wrote when the Biden administration was trying to get a normalization deal between Israel and the Saudis. And what was in it for the Palestinians was not a compromise that would give them the state that they've been seeking for more than 70 years now, but rather a pathway to keep the option, the dream alive. So we've gone from actually promising to achieve a two-state solution to promising to achieve the survival of the dream of a two-state solution. So we're not doing those things that the president is saying. And, and again, the, the normalization deal was premised on the idea that you can just ignore the Palestinians, that you can, as Jared Kushner said, because this is all built on what Trump's uh, Abram Accord was, that you can move beyond the Palestinian issue, not even a desire and ambition to resolve it, but you can move beyond it because that conflict has now become so contained that we don't have to bother trying to resolve it. In essence and in practice, that has been US policy. The rhetoric has been that we still believe in a two-state solution, et cetera, et cetera. Part of the reason why we still say that we do is because it sounds good. And the minute we say that we don't, 
when we recognize that we have also helped kill the pathway for a two-state solution, that's when we would have a very active uh, a crisis, even short of what Hamas did here. So we keep on saying it, but it's a pretense game. We really do have to shift to being serious about this, particularly mindful of the fact that that instability has a significant likelihood of sucking the United States into a conflict that we should not be involved in militarily. So say a two-state solution gets pursued. What indication do we have that Hamas would in any way agree to that? Play this out for me a little bit. Well, first of all, Hamas is not in control of the West Bank. They're in control okay. of, well, of sure, Gaza. Yeah. Sure. So, uh, I would agree in terms of like, like the way tensions are right now, why do we think that that is what would be happening? Well, you're saying that right now, but why didn't we do it three, four weeks ago? Why didn't we do it during this entire period in which we didn't have this? Instead, we just gave lip service to the two-state solution and continued to pursue a policy that essentially buried it in the ground. You're quite right that under the current circumstances, it's going to be extremely difficult to just get any diplomacy going. Uh, but that is nevertheless ultimately where we have to end up. Uh, and that and these moments are the extremely difficult moments in which you have to set your ambitions a little bit more realistically. It has to be about de-escalation, ceasefire. Once you have that, it creates a bit of a pause that creates political momentum to escalate it towards a bigger political agenda and then move towards uh, a real negotiation to actually end this conflict. It's not so that tomorrow there can be a meeting with all of these parties at the table and they would actually talk about this issue. There's several preliminary steps that need to be taken. If we don't take them, however, we will never get to the point of actually having the real diplomacy and we will also not have the de-escalation that can keep the United States out of this war. I have to assume that this, this such a negotiation would involve the Palestinian Authority cooperating with Israel and partners to facilitate the complete expulsion of Hamas because there's no way that we're coming out of this on the heels of a brutal terrorist attack giving a with you know giving a two state salute giving an, an independent palestine that it that would just send the message i, I would assume that terrorism works and the way is an acceptable want, right? method like, of negotiation. Yeah. I think the pathway here is to first recognize that there needs to be uh, a, a negotiation uh, with the Palestinian Authority, who, by the way, incidentally, is lacking significant legitimacy amongst Palestinians as well. Uh, the majority of Palestinians in the West Bank tend to see the Palestinian Authority essentially having taken over the management of the occupation and collaborating with the Israelis in that kind. So it's not as if, you know, uh, there's a partner there that has the backing of its population, and that further complicates matters. But I can see a pathway in which there is first a negotiation that I actually get serious about a two-state solution. And such a two-state solution has to deal with what the United States used to call illegal uh, settlements on Palestinian territory. We have significantly softened our language and in our opposition to that, even though those are violations of international law, and even though they have made uh, the prospects of a two-state solution far, far less likely. We have green-lighted that, uh, which again is in practice, we're moving in a direction of making a two-state solution uh, next to impossible, but rhetorically, we still talk about it as if that is our goal. But that, that there, sort of dodges yeah. the question that, Z that Zach just asked, right? Like. There would be this problem of if, you know, ultimately we, there there was a two state solution that was pursued and, and, and granted and gotten that would send the message. I mean, you, you have to fully stamp out Hamas before that. No, no. Hold on. Let right? me let me get clarification. What do you mean that there was a two state solution and um, that was there? No, no, no. I'm uh, saying if if there were to be a two state solution in the aftermath of this surely one of the stipulations would have to be that Hamas can in no way exercise any power within this region because otherwise there is this message sent of, you know, you commit terroristic acts and get rewarded for your efforts, right? Like, certainly. Uh, yeah, no, I, I, I sorry, I, I better understand the question now. Thank you. Sorry, I might um, uh, so, uh, for, first of all, let's, let's recognize that in the past negotiations, the West Bank and Gaza oftentimes have been separated. Let's also recognize that if there actually is a valid process that is genuinely moving towards a two-state solution, guess what that does? 
it delegitimizes Hamas. Hamas is managing to get a degree of support precisely because there is no diplomacy, precisely because there is no uh, the implementation of the measures that Israel was supposed to do were never implemented. And instead, we've seen an increase of settlement activity and the de facto annexation of Palestinian territory. So there's a clear perception in the region that that diplomacy did not yield what it was supposed to do. And then that further gives legitimacy and support for a rejectionist organization like Hamas, who was opposed to that process from the outset. If you actually truly want to get rid of that type of a radicalism, by being able to have an, a genuine process that is genuinely seeking a solution. That's the best way of weakening Hamas. And then after that, then you know that dynamic in and of itself can create new opportunities in, uh, in Gaza um, uh, that can help get the Palestinian population themselves there, get rid of Hamas and get a leadership that is willing to participate in the process. But right now, given the track record of uh, how negotiations have been used, to expand settlements. That is right now not, not something that has a lot of buyers amongst the uh, Palestinians. And this what? is what I'm saying. We have to completely reverse this if we truly want to get a, a resolution here. The assumption had been, this is okay. There's never going to be a major amount of violence and destabilization here because we have managed to contain um, uh, the Palestinians. We've managed to contain their aspirations. We have AI and all of this technology. They can never do anything else. So the cost of just going on with the status quo and the occupation is manageable. And that was fundamentally disproven. Hey, thanks for watching that clip from our conversation with Trita Parsi about whether the U.S. can and should de-escalate things in the Middle East. You can watch another clip right here or the full conversation over here.